Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, welcome. There is coffee and water in the back. What a beautiful day. How's everyone doing today? Right on, right on. Well, I, my name is Brent Go. for those of you I have not met yet, and uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, I've got to know Kyle Whistle over the past seven years, and uh, especially, well, the past two years, and Kyle's story is he started in real estate 15 years ago in uh, um, Bakersfield, no, I'm kidding, San Diego, <laughs> San Diego, California. He's been the number one agent for all companies in San Diego for seven years. I think San Diego would be the best town in the world to be the top dog in, right? And so I found out he had never been to Napa and the French Laundry, so I flat out bribed him with food and expensive wine. And uh, so tomorrow, we're going to spend tomorrow and Saturday there with his wife, Brittany, and we're going to have a good time. But today, he's going to share with you how he sells $400 million a year in real estate down in San Diego, which is like two houses. So it's really not that impressive. <laughs> but... Um, you know, a lot of you do a lot more than Kyle, but uh, he's an amazing guy, gifted communicator. You're in for a treat. Take a lot of notes. Help me welcome from San Diego, California, Mr. <laughs> Kyle Whistle. Thank you, everyone. Right. right. Are there markers up there? Markers up here. Uh, uh, yeah, there's, yeah, 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 you got three, okay. three of them. Okay. You sure they don't work? <laughs> All right, what's going on, guys? I appreciate you guys all coming out here. Um, I'm going to be here for the next two hours. My goal is to give you guys as much value as I possibly can in the next two hours. Um, I'm not a fluff guy. I might cuss a little bit. Don't take it personal. It just happens. Uh, if you guys have ever been to a Tony Robbins event, if you read the front page of the book at Tony Robbins, it actually tells you, like, it's actually like intelligent to use cuss words because it actually drives home emphasis. So if I cuss, because I'm trying to make sure you're paying attention. And you're going to be here for two hours, so you might get a little bit tired. So I might just drop an F-bomb to wake you the fuck up. So <laughs> this is how we roll. All right, so what I want to talk about today, your market is very, very similar to my market. I pulled up your stats last night compared to ours. You guys are up 27% year over year according to Redfin. Your average days on market is seven. Again, this is according to Redfin. I actually believe Redfin more than a lot of other sources, believe it or not. We're at 29.7% year over year, and we're at like 10 days on market. So we're in very, very similar markets. And so the message today is going to really be about how do you crush in this market? Because it's tough. Those of you guys that have been around a while, you're like, what the hell is going on? This is ridiculous. I'm literally having to give up a kidney to get a house. And those of you guys that are new is like, this sucks. Like, everybody said this was going to be easy. This is freaking difficult. So I'm going to share 12 very, very specific strategies with you guys, uh, six that are going to help you guys with getting your offers accepted. And I'm going to share six strategies with you guys to help you land more listings, which is way more fun. Because um, trying to get your offer accepted right now is very, very tough. So um, I'm going to dive in. We'll start by talking about getting your offer accepted. And number one, there we go. Follow the effing instructions. <laughs> Follow the effing instructions. Follow the effing instructions. The number one way to get your offer put at the bottom of the pile is to not follow the instructions. I know this seems way too simple. It seems so damn simple. We'll sell over 600 houses this year. And we will have over 6,000 agents not follow the instructions. It is insane how difficult it is for some people to read the agent remarks, to read the showing instructions. If they put in the showing instructions to text them at this number, text them at that damn number. Don't call them. They didn't want you to call them. If they wanted you to call them, they'd tell you to call them. Nobody wants to talk to you just because you're showing the house. If you want to put pen to paper, we could talk. We can have a conversation. Nobody wants to talk to you just because you're scheduling a showing. If they say text them, send them a text. If they say to go on showing time, go on showing time. If they say there's only showings allowed Friday from 2 to 5, then figure out how to get there between 2 and 5. Don't ask them, oh, can we go at 1 o'clock? No, it says 2 to 5. Figure it the fuck out. You've got to go between 2 and 5. That's what they want. I just sold my house. That process sucks. It's not a fun process. So if I built my entire week around allowing you to come in my home from 2 to 5, guess what I'm going to be doing at 1? I'm getting the house ready. 
so that it looks good for everybody who followed the instructions and is going to come between 2 and 5. So just follow the instructions. Then read the agent remarks. If it says call this person with questions, call that person. Don't always call the listing agent. If my name's on it and you call me, I might not even know what property you're talking about. You might ask me about 123 Main Street and I have no idea. I've never seen it. I don't know anything about it. My name might just be on there. So you're going to ask me. I don't know anything. If it says call Bob, call Bob. It says call Mary, call Mary. It says text Bob, text Bob. Follow those instructions. I know this seems so simple, but it's not. Because if it was simple, everybody would be doing it. Nobody's doing it. Um, if the offer instructions say you got to cross-qualify with Sarah at Celebrity Lending, call Sarah at Celebrity Lending and get your cross-qual. Because nobody else does. They all just submit the offer blindly with no pre-approval. Well, guess what happens? If I have 20 offers on a property and only one out of those 20 actually followed my instructions and did the cross-qual, they go to the top of the stack, not the bottom of the stack. So if they want a cross-qual, give them the damn cross-qual. They're not going to steal your buyer. Get that out of your head. Quit thinking small-minded. Get rid of that scarcity mindset. Give them the pre-approval if they want it. Does your buyer have to call and do it? No. Get your lender on the phone with their lender. They'll send them over a copy package and they'll sign off on them. That's all we want as a listing agent. I just want to know your buyer's good to go. I want to know that your buyer didn't just go on a website, punch in a social security number to get a pre-approval out, and then submit that pre-approval knowing that they never looked at your tax returns, your bank statements, your pay stubs, or anything. All they got was a credit report and they gave you a pre-approval. That's why we do it. I'm not doing it because I want to steal your buyer. I don't want my lender to steal your buyer. I'm doing it because I want to make sure your buyer can actually buy this damn home. Because once we go under contract, there's a lot of wheels that start getting in motion. And if it falls apart, I'm going to have a really pissed off seller. And I don't want a pissed off seller because if I've got a pissed off seller, I'm pissed off at you. You don't want that. So if they say get a cross call, get a damn cross call. It's not that hard. It's not that big of a deal. Quit fighting it. You'll be amazed what happens on how many more offers you get accepted. If they tell you to fax the offer, Find, call your grandma and ask her if you could borrow a fax machine and fax the damn offer. If they tell you to email it, make sure you email it to the address they tell you to email it to. Because people all the time will email it to whatever the agent email is. But what if I have offers at Whistle Realty? If I say email to offers at Whistle Realty, email to offers at Whistle Realty. I don't want to see it. There's somebody on my team who handles that. If they say submit it on this website, submit it on the damn website. Oh, but then I have to put all the information in again. Good. Do it. That's so I don't have to go digging through your stupid offer that's got the pages all out of order, one page upside down, one page <laughs> sideways, one page right side up, and then there's no pre Like, I don't have time for that. I have you submit it to a portal so that I can just look at a glance and I can see everything. I don't even have to open your offer because I don't have time to sift and sort through that. So the number one thing, guys, like, if nothing else, just be a little bit more conscious of this. Make sure that you're following these instructions. What's funny is my assistant is moving up to an agent now. And literally the very first property he went to show, he's like, hey, I, I scheduled this showing, but I haven't heard back from them. And I was like, OK. How'd you schedule it? Well, I did it on showing time. Pull up the MLS. First freaking line. Text this number to schedule a showing. I literally want to smack him in the back of the head. Just follow the instructions, guys. Like, this is somebody who's literally in the car with me for the last two years, Like has heard me say this over and over and over again. Still. I don't know why it's so hard for everybody. Just follow the instructions, please. Like, as a listing agent, we beg you, follow the instructions and you'll get rewarded for it. Next up is this is a conversation sport. This is a contact sport. We've got to actually talk to people. And ideally, we've got to talk to people over the phone. You do not negotiate deals over text messages. You do not negotiate deals over email. You negotiate deals on the phone. And I know all of you guys that are small-minded are thinking like, well, the listing agent will never answer the phone. Just get that out of your head. Call them 46 freaking times until they answer. Get them on the phone. Drive to their freaking office. Stalk them on Instagram and find out where they're having lunch and just conveniently show up there. <laughs> you find a way. Because I'm not going to be mad at you. I'm actually going to be impressed because of how bad I know you want the property if you're going to stalk me and find where I'm at. But we got to have conversations with people. Because if you're going to submit an offer, you want to make sure you're writing an offer that's going to appeal to that particular seller. Don't assume that the seller wants a quick close. When I just put my house on the market, I put it on the market in May with an intention of not moving until August. 
If you wrote me a 10-day cash close offer, you freaked my wife the hell out. She's like, no, I'm not ready for this. This is too much. I can't handle this. Like, that could actually hurt you. You think you're helping yourself by writing a 10-day cash close, when in reality, you just freaked the seller the hell out. On the flip side, what if you got somebody who's vacant and they're hurting? I have a seller right now who has uh, a note that's due by the end of this month. And if it doesn't close by the end of this month, they're screwed. They have like a six-figure penalty. Well, if I knew that, Maybe I'd figure out a creative way to close the deal quick enough so that I can get that seller out of it. But the only way I'm going to find that out is to actually have a conversation with the listing agent. So you guys have got to get in the habit of actually talking to people. You got to call them. If they won't answer the phone, text them, hey, I need to talk to you. Call them, call them, call them. I don't care. Yes, is it annoying if somebody calls me 10 times? Yes, but I will answer it eventually. I will, because I'm actually going to respect the hustle. I'm going to respect the fact that they're going to do that. So, when I say drill down on what's important, I want you to get the listing agent on the phone and I want you to ask them what's important to the seller in the offer that we write. Find out, do they want a quick close? Do they want a long close? Do they need a rent back? Do they not need a rent back? If the deal busted previously, why did it bust? Was it an inspection issue? Was it an appraisal issue? If I know that information, that's gonna give me the information I need to craft a more uh, acceptable offer, a more attractive offer for that seller. But the only way I'm going to find that is to actually talk to the freaking agent. I need to know what the seller's motivation is. I need to know where are they going, when are they going to get there, how can I help, what do they need in an offer. You never know what the seller wants. Don't ever assume you know what the seller wants. And then the second set of questions you got to start asking every time you write an offer is, what's important to you as the agent? Because we all know we make a lot of the decisions for our clients. So if you ask me what's important, I'm say, hey, I, I have a lot of vendor relationship. I want Snap NHD for the NHD report. I want Pinnacle escrow for the escrow. I want Fidelity title for this. I want Home Warranty of American. I don't want it over this amount. I want it to be this, 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 this. I want you to remove this contingency. Like, I'm going to tell you. And if you follow my instructions, you can literally make an offer that doesn't even require a counter. I like that because that's a lot less work for me. If you actually listen to me, and what I told you my seller wants, and what I want, and you write me an offer that's literally acceptable as written, I freaking love you. I don't have time, to, I don't wanna go back and forth with counters for a week and have to take more phone calls from people who didn't read the fact that it says text this person for questions. But yet you're calling me bugging me because you don't follow the instructions. Like, I don't have time for that. So if you can actually find out this information, this is how you end up at the top of the stack. Follow the instructions, talk to the agent, and you guys, when you talk to an agent, a lot of times they'll say like, oh, how many offers are there? Where do we need to come in at to get a deal done? Probably doesn't work out very well, right? Rarely is an agent like, oh, well, just come in at 750, it's yours. Every once in a while it's gonna happen. But they're gonna be like, you know what, just put your best foot forward, just put it all on the table, put yourself out there, just give it everything you got. Okay, well, here's where the magic of being on the phone comes into play. If I say, you know what, Bob, what if I come in at 750, how would that stack up? Now we get to have some fun, because now I get to read you. I get to read how you respond, how quickly you respond, how confidently you respond, how many words you use when you respond. I can't do that over a text message. I'm giving you time to think, and I have no idea what kind of emotion you're putting behind that text response. But if I'm on the phone, I'll read you. I could read you from a mile away if I'm on the phone. If I could hear the tone of voice, if I hear how fast you respond, how many words you use, do you keep talking over and over and over again because you're bullshitting me, I will smell that bullshit through the phone. But I can't do that over a text. I can't do that over an email. But I could do that over the phone. So I float numbers out there constantly. Hey, how would we be looking if we came in at this? Would this, you know, if I came in at 750, would that get the job done? Let's try floating those questions out there as opposed to where do we need to be. You'd be shocked what happens when you actually do that. All right, next up. These are probably two things that you guys are running into a lot. If you guys are up 27%, we're up 29%, we're right there in the same boat. Appraisals are an issue. We all know this, right? We're all having issues with appraisals. Still, the majority of them are somehow coming back where they need to. I don't know how, but they do. Um, but it's a fear as a seller. It's a huge fear as a seller. I just listed one. 
The most recent model match was like 1.4. We listed at 1.5, and somebody paid 1.6. I'm like, that's 200,000 over the last model match. So if you call me and you ask me questions, I'm going to tell you I'm concerned about the appraisal. Well, great. Now you can cover part of the appraisal gap. I want you to put in writing, right? If I tell you as an agent I'm concerned about the appraisal, then I'm looking for you to address that concern. I'm looking for you to either come in with no appraisal contingency, or if you're going to have an appraisal contingency, I want to know how much of that shortage you're going to cover. Are you going to cover 50 grand, 100 grand, 200? What are you going to cover? And if you say you're going to cover it, you better provide me the proof of funds to show that you can actually cover it. Are the appraisals coming in low very often? No. I think we'll sell like 70 houses this month. Do we have one low appraisal? Nope. But if it's going to make the listing agent feel good, that's your job, right? Make them feel good. Make your offer attractive. So don't be afraid to write something in there that you'll cover the appraisal gap. And what happens if it does appraise? What if it appraises at 1.4 and you said 1.6? You probably have some other contingencies left over. There's a lot of different contingencies that are involved in a transaction. There's a physical inspection. There's a title report inspection. There's a little website called Megan's Law. Fun fact, pull up your address on there. There's a sex offender within a mile on there. I promise you, I don't care where you live in Sacramento. I don't care where you live in San Diego. If my appraisal comes in low, I might have to pull up Megan's Law for that property and send it to my seller and say, are you sure you want to live here? And maybe your, your buyer conveniently changed their mind and they don't want to live there anymore. You can cancel with good faith under your inspection contingency. Just floating that out there. Do what you want with it. Not telling you what to do. Just giving you ideas. Um, just because you said you'd cover 200, Megan's Law is a scary website. So agree to cover an appraisal shortage. Waive the appraisal altogether. That's going to go a really, really long way for you. Um, the other thing is offering free rent backs. I've been blown away how valuable offering a free rent back is to a seller. Because most people who are selling right now, they're, right, we all live in California. We know we have a ton of people leaving. Um, or they're moving up, because that's one of those two things is what's happening. We both deal with the same thing. So if your client's either moving out of state or they're moving up to a bigger home, how do they cover that gap from when the first house closes to the second house? They need a rent back. That's stressful. That's scary. Right? I'm on my rent back now. I actually move when I get back home next week. Um, the fact that I got to be in my house for an extra month and a half from when the first sale closed to when I need to move, my wife loved that. Like That was massive for her. And the fact that the agent or that the buyer was willing to just let us have that rent back for free is massive. It's a psychological thing. People actually throw the dollars and cents out the window of the fact that like, in a traditional market, if you're newer, like what's customary is that the buyer will cover, or the seller will cover the buyer's mortgage, prorated for however many days it is. So if the buyer buys the home, it's a $5,000 mortgage, and they stay for a month, seller's paying five grand. Well, as a buyer, if I can come in and say, hey, Mr. Seller, don't worry about the five grand. I'll take care of it. It is exponentially more valuable than the $5,000 that you would get. It's worth like $50,000 just to give a free rent back. Like I've been blown away because they're stressing like, oh my gosh, we got an offer, right? Most of our sellers are getting an offer. You guys are seven days average market time. They get an offer in a week. They're like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect it to sell that fast. Even though you told them it would and seven days is normal. They're like, oh gosh, I didn't think it was really going to happen. What are we going to do? Oh my gosh, oh my God. They're freaking out. And you're like, hey, it's okay, Mr. Seller. They're going to let you guys stay until October. What happens? They're like, oh. That's the buyer that I want to work with. It goes such a long way. You've got to offer that free rent back. Quit writing in a dollar amount for a rent back. Give it away for free, please. Like, it will blow your mind how a buyer react or seller reacts when you give the uh, seller that free rent back. It's huge. I've watched that completely change the game. I've watched my sellers literally take lower offers just because they gave a free rent back because they felt like that person understood them. They felt like that person sympathize with them and was looking out for them as opposed to the person who just wanted the house. It's amazing what that'll do. So I strongly encourage you guys, if you're doing rent backs, make sure to write those in free. Now, we are also in California, and the tenant landlord laws are pretty crazy here, right? You can't even evict somebody unless they're cooking meth in your garage. 
So when you do this, I learned this recently, because I have an agent who used to be a tenant landlord attorney. If you give somebody a free rent back, guess what happens at the end of the rent back? What is the rental amount? It's free. So if they choose not to move out, they're still there for free. So if you're going to give a free rent back, you better make sure you build a per diem penalty in that if they hold over past the move out date on the rent back, there better be a dollar amount attached to it at that point. Because if you don't, now we never expect a seller to be like, no, I'm not leaving, I'm staying here forever. But they could, and they have no rent on that. And trying to get somebody evicted today in California is very, very difficult. So make sure if you do give a free rent back, you add something in there that says if seller fails to move by whatever paragraph date it is, then there shall be a per diem penalty of X dollars per day. Very, very important if you guys are gonna do this. You gotta look out for your client. We hope it never happens, but if it does, that seller could just keep staying there. We're like, well, we're not ready yet, and, and technically the agreement says we pay zero dollars for this rent back. They could stay there a long time, and then even after you evict them, you can't go back and collect unpaid rent because there is none. So keep that in mind when you write that free rent back in there. <clears throat> Next up is reduce or eliminate contingencies. So we, here in California, we have three primary contingencies, the inspection, the appraisal, and the loan. Try to eliminate as many of those as humanly possible. How many of you guys have sold 100 plus homes in here, just in your career? What's the average request for repairs you've written? Three to five grand traditionally? Is it, how often is it over five grand? It's pretty rare, right? Most requests for repairs are under $5,000. Every once in a while you got a crazy foundation issue, roof issue, but those you usually know those going into the inspection. Most properties are five grand or less. So just tell your buyer, hey, we're gonna come in, we're just not even gonna put an inspection contingency. I just wanna prepare you in advance. There's gonna be some repairs are needed. In my experience, it's typically three to $5,000 worth of repairs. So let's just go in without it, because it's gonna help the seller rest a lot easier at night, knowing that we're not gonna come back and try to chop their legs off after we get into this transaction. Just prep your buyer, hey, just be prepared to spend five. Just put it out there up front. By putting it out there up front, they're gonna be like, Okay, I mean, if, it's, if you think it's gonna be five, I'm good with that, let's just, let's skip it. Do you know how valuable that five grand is to that seller? Do you know how valuable it is to me as the listing agent that I'm not gonna have to deal with your bullshit request for repairs where you're, you don't want me to patch up the wall because there's a nail hole in it. Like, that's the last thing I wanna see as a listing agent. So you become a lot more attractive to me as well when I know I'm not gonna have to deal with the request for repairs. Being a heavy listing agent, the request for repairs is my least favorite part of listing a home for sale. So if I know that by working with you, I don't have to deal with the request for repairs, top of the stack. So just prep your buyer for it. Um, what we've actually started doing too is there's an inspection company in town and we just book weekly appointments with them before we even have properties. We just book off time slots. And then we'll actually just have the inspectors go do a walkthrough of our listings um, or the, the places our buyers wanna purchase on Mondays, and then they'll just walk through and tell our buyer like, hey, I noticed this, 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 and now the buyer knows what they're getting into, because you're gonna have some buyers who aren't okay with trusting you that it's gonna be under five grand. So we actually use the inspector, we can pay him less money because it's only a verbal inspection. We set him up for Mondays, because as we know, most people are reviewing offers like Monday afternoon. So we get the inspectors out on Monday morning, have them walk through the house Monday morning, and now they can tell the buyer like, hey, you know, looking at this, 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 you're probably gonna be about three grand. You're gonna be about two grand. You're gonna be about five, six grand. So now the buyer already has that information up front and they can take that into account when writing the offer. So think about doing something like that as well. Then you've got the appraisal contingency. Kind of touched on that a little bit with the last one, but put your money where your mouth is. If your buyer's got the money to cover it, Ditch the appraisal contingency. It's a huge concern for listing agents that there's an appraisal contingency. The more you alleviate my concerns, the more I wanna work with you. So if your buyer's got the cash to cover an appraisal shortage, or they got two million bucks in the bank and they're buying a $750,000 house, ditch the damn appraisal contingency. Just throw it out the window. We know that 95% of the time it's gonna come in at value. I'll roll, my, I'll roll the dice that it's gonna be one of those 95 and not the five. Like, let's run with that. But if you can eliminate that appraisal contingency, that's gonna help you out a ton. The other one is the loan contingency. 
there's certain banks out there. Uh, one of the ones we work with, there's no sponsors for this, right? I'm not like stepping on a lender's toe. So um, <laughs> we work with Homelight. If you guys have never done loans with Homelight, they have a loan where they have a $100,000 EMD guarantee. Because what they will do is they will fully underwrite the buyer up front. They'll run their own valuation on the home, which will allow you to write a non-contingent offer. And if for any reason they don't get the loan done and the deal falls apart, they'll reimburse your buyer up to $100,000 on their EMD. Think about that. That's pretty powerful, right? If I could write an offer with no loan contingency, no appraisal contingency, no contingencies at all, I'm not only on the top of the stack, I just conveniently blew all the other offers off the table, right? Like, I don't even have competition anymore if I can come in. And that's on a financed offer. They can do that with 5% down. 5% down, you could literally write a non-contingent offer, and if the deal blows up because the loan doesn't get done, Homelight will give you the money back. It's pretty crazy. And whether you use Homelight or your lender, go to your lender and be like, hey, Kyle Whistle said that Homelight's doing this, can you match it? Sorry for any lenders in here, I just screwed you. Um, but we went back to my lender, and he's like, I'll do it. F it, I'll do it. So you never know. Go to your lender. If your lender doesn't, and you use Homelight, at least you gave them a shot, right? Um, so there's things out there that can help you with this stuff. Next up, triangulate mutual connections. So this is a very, very important one. Um, people like to work with agents that they know. Right? If we've done, I've, my buddies in my general area, I'm one of those I like to be friends with all my competitors. I don't talk shit about my competitors. That's a bad look. Don't do that. If you talk shit about your competitor, they will hear about it. Don't do it. It's a really bad look. Strongly discourage you um, from doing something like that. It will get back around to who you talk shit about. Be friends with your competitors, especially the best agents in your area. I don't care if you're experienced or you're new. When you leave here, call whoever your biggest competitor is and invite them out to coffee or grab a beer. You want to be friends with those people because they know you know what you're doing. You know they know what you're doing, what they're doing. It's much more fun to work with people that we know, like, and trust. If I got 20 offers, I want to work with a girl that I've worked with six or seven times before. I know she knows what she's doing. I don't know these other 19 people, but I know her and I know we've done business together and she's a rock star. And I'm going to tell my seller that. There's nothing wrong with me telling my seller that. So the seller can, is going to trust me, right? They trusted me enough to pay me a $30,000, $40,000 commission. They're going to trust that I've worked with her six times and she's great. So there's going to be those direct connections, but sometimes you don't have a direct connection. That's where you're going to triangulate. So there's a few different ways to triangulate. Uh, number one is just go on Facebook. Pull up that listing agent. When you pull up that listing agent, there's going to be a little button that says friends. Tap on it. When you tap on it, it's going to say, here are all of your mutual friends. So even if I don't know the listing agent, maybe I need to get to her, but I've never met her, but he's her mutual friend, and we're friends, I'm going to use you to get to her. I'm going to say, hey, how well do you know Sarah? Oh, Sarah and I went to high school together. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, I'm writing an offer on Sarah's listing. Like, can you put in a good word for me? And then you'll send the message to Sarah and be like, hey, Kyle's a great agent. You know, we've done a bunch of business together. I think he's submitting an offer on 123 Main Street. Like, if there's anything you can do to help him get it, that'd be awesome. And I'm going to use you to get to her. Super powerful. Maybe I, I want to know her if I can, but if I don't, I'm going to use you to get to her. I'm going to use somebody to get to him. So when I pull up on Facebook and it shows me those mutual connections, I'm hitting those mutual connections up, trying to find out which one of them really knows Sarah well, and they can vouch for me. Because if 20 offers are in, she's never worked with 20 of them, but he's vouching for me, that's going to help put me up to the top of that stack. So you can do that on Facebook. You can do that on LinkedIn. Yes, people actually use LinkedIn. We all signed up for it once. We all added everybody we knew once. Then you got guys like me who are like sending you those messages all the time. Guess what? Those messages work. As crazy as you think they are, they do work. Um, but you find who do you have in connection on LinkedIn? Who do I have on connection on Facebook? And then if not, if you guys are on a team or you're in a brokerage, ask around your brokerage. Hey, who in here knows Sarah? Our agents are instructed every time before they write an offer that they have to put a post up in our group to ask who knows this agent. We're doing everything we can to triangulate to get to that listing agent. If you guys are sensing the trend here, like your job is to impress the listing agent. Your job is to impress the seller, make them like you. 
You've got to do everything in your power to get them to like you. So figure out who the hell do we have in common. Somebody in my brokerage knows Sarah. Somebody on my Facebook list knows Sarah. Does somebody on my LinkedIn list know Sarah? I'm going to find my way to Sarah. And even if not, I'm still going to add Sarah. And I'm going to start engaging on her post so that when my offer comes through or she gets my phone call, she's like, oh, yeah, you just added me on Facebook. Oh, what a coincidence. So I'm going to triangulate and do whatever I got to do to get Sarah. Next up is you got to leverage your lender. So I already gave you one way to leverage them. Um, but the other way to leverage them, how many of you guys, when you submit your offer, are CCing the lender? It's good. You guys are either good or you're full of shit. <laughs> either way, I'm impressed. <laughs> you got to leverage your lender. Whenever I submit an offer, I'm CCing my lender 100% of the time. As soon as I CC the lender, I'm then following up with the lender and I'm sending them, here's the listing agent's um, phone number, he, obviously they have their email address, here's the property that the clients are offering on. My expectation is my lender is going to call that person now. My expectation is that the lender is going to send them the DU approval, my lender is going to send them the credit report, my lender is going to send them all of that stuff. I want my lender to say, hey, you know what, Bob and, and Kelly, they're awesome buyers, I actually sat down with them fully vetted them out, here's their DU, here's their credit report, their DTI's 28 on the front end, 36 on the back end, he's a sheriff, she's a nurse, they're good to go. That's what I'm expecting out of my lender. And then I'm expecting the lender to hype me up. Say, oh, have you worked with Kyle before? Oh no, you haven't? Kyle's amazing, I've worked with him for the last 10 years, he's a great agent, we do a ton of business together, he's not one of those agents who's gonna jerk you around, he's a straight shooter, he's gonna give you straight, you're gonna have a great escrow with him. I'm expecting my lender to do that. If my lender doesn't, I'm going to find a new lender. Because we're on the same team, right? The lender's not getting paid unless I'm getting paid. So the lender better do whatever the hell he or she can to get me paid. So I'm expecting them to hype me up. That's their job. So if you're not doing that, it might be time for a new lender. If your lender's not willing to do that for you, you might need to find a new lender. If your buyer comes to you with a pre-approval letter, and there's not even like a lender name on it, USAA, Navy Fed, some of those. Like, that's bad. You need to get in contact with the lender. If a buyer comes to you with a pre-approval letter, again, even if I'm representing you, I don't trust that pre-approval. Because like we said, you could have just went on a website, punched in a social, and it spit out a pre-approval. That pre-approval is not worth the paper that it's written on. So if somebody comes to me with a pre-approval, first I'm going to try to get them to work with my lender that I know, like, and trust. But if not, I'm calling whatever lender it is they got pre-approved with. We're going to have a conversation. I want to make sure that they vetted that buyer. And I want to make sure they understand my expectation from them. Because when I submit this offer, I'm going to CC you. And here's what you're going to do. And if the lender's not cool with that, I'm going to tell the buyer. Say, hey, just so you know, this is what my lenders typically do. Your lender is not willing to go to bat for you. Are you sure you want to work with this lender? Guess who they're going to work with? And work with my lender because they know my lender is going to go to bat for them. So that should be something that you expect from your lender 100% of the time. They are on your team. They should be going to bat for you. They should be going to bat for the buyer because most buyers are just submitting that Navy Fed pre-approval that they got off the internet when they punched in a social. When your lender actually follows up, here's the DU, here's the credit report, here's the DTI, the listing agent is like, holy shit, these guys got their stuff together. Like, that's who I want to work with, especially when they present it as a team. We've done a lot of deals together. Like, that's going to help you guys out a ton. All right. Feel good about that? Okay. Okay. So we're going to talk about landing listings. You guys are probably all hoping I'm going to tell you about this, like, magic button that you push, and listings are just going to, like, come raining down in your lap. That would be freaking cool. If you find it, let me know. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with the Acres of Diamonds story? A couple of you? Okay, cool. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to nail this, but I'll tell you the basics of it. I might screw it up. Just don't call me out on it. You can tell, like, like send me a DM later and tell me I screwed it up. But here's how this story works. Is there's this guy who lives on a farm, and he starts hearing all these stories about these people that are mining diamonds, and they're getting super rich, and you know, becoming millionaires, and it, this guy falls in love with his dream of being like this uh, diamond miner. And he's like, you know what, screw it, I'm gonna sell the farm, and I'm gonna go find diamonds. I'm gonna be a diamond miner, I'm gonna get my millions of diamonds. And he does, he sells the farm. 
And he starts traveling the world. And he's searching high and low all over the world trying to find diamonds. And strikes out here, strikes out there, strikes out here, strikes out there. Just keeps striking out. Goes into a deep state of depression. And ultimately decides to kill himself. Jumps into a tidal wave and drowns and dies. Years later, the person who bought his farm is walking around. There's a little river on the farm and sees a rock in there and says, oh, this is kind of a cool rock. It's kind of shiny and puts it up on his mantle. And a friend comes over and is, they're sitting, hanging out. And it's like, hey, what, is, what do you have up on the mantle? And he's like, oh, it's some rock I found down by the river. He's like, that's not a rock. That's a diamond. He's like, what do you mean? And they come to discover that that was this gigantic diamond that this guy found down by the river on this farm. They end up mining and finding acres and acres of diamonds. And the moral of this story is you guys are sitting on acres of diamonds right now. But those acres of diamonds are your database. And you're not doing shit with it. You're out here trying to find this magic fucking button that you're going to hit and is going to make listings rain down from the sky that you don't have to do any work for. And they're just going to fall in your lap and they're all going to sign at like 8% commission. And, and they'll let you keep seven and give the other agent one. That's what you think is going to happen. That's probably why you came here today hoping I was going to like tell you about this magic 8% button. Sorry, bursting your bubble. So, we got to work our database before we worry about anything else, before we worry about trying to find one new lead source or anything. We've got to work our database. That's your acres of diamonds. You're sitting on it. Like, I think my phone's over there, but like, he's on his phone right now. Like, his acres of diamonds are in his hand right now. He doesn't have to go chase a new lead source. He doesn't have to go give away 35% referral fees or pay $200 a lead or do anything crazy, do an open house in this freaking weather. He doesn't have to do any of that. <laughs> It's freaking hot here, guys. <laughs> you guys are all welcome to come down to San Diego. It's like 75. And it'll be 75 in a couple months, and 75 a couple months after that, and 75 a couple months after that, and it's pretty much 75 all year. There's actually a real estate company called like 75 and Sunny in San Diego. It's literally the name of their real estate company. It's a real thing. So we got to work our database. We've got to do it. So I'm going to give you the specific stuff that we do with our database. And then you can compare and contrast this to what you guys are doing right now. Um, any of you guys with Keller Williams or been with Keller? Yeah. Cool. They talk about a 33 touch program. That was cool a long time ago. 33 touches. 33 is not nearly enough touches right now. I'm going to argue with you, you need 33 touches a week with people. 33 touches a year? That's not going to cut it anymore. So some of the things that we like to do, if you guys are familiar with me at all, I love video. Um, we've been named number one video influencer in North America by BombBomb. Uh, I think Inman put an article out, we're top five video influencers to watch this year. We do a shitload of video. Um, so I encourage you to follow the video stuff that we do. You guys probably can't read this at all, but it's cool. We do 24 video messages a year to our database. 24. For those of you guys that aren't strong in math, that's two a month. <laughs> we like to get two videos a month out to our database every single month. One of those videos is going to be a market update, and one of those is going to be an FAQ. FAQ is frequently asked questions, so you don't have to bump your neighbor and feel awkward. Okay, so market update videos. Here's the thing to know. I was able to pull the data up for your market last night so that I have an idea of what I'm walking into. I know how to interpret data. Your clients can pull that same data up, but what your clients don't know how to do is to how to interpret the data. When you do your market update, you should not sit there and be like, all right, guys, well, it's seven days on market. We're up 27%, blah, 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 blah. There's this much inventory. Like, OK, they knew that. They could pull that up on Redfin. They can pull that up on Zillow. It's readily available to them. They have that info. What does it mean? And how does that actually like relate? Because if I tell you, like, I see a lot of agents post like, oh, there's 622 new listings this week. OK. <laughs> how many were there last week? How many were there like the same time a year ago? Like, we got to help with that. Don't just say, yeah, we had 
7,700 homes hit the market last month. And values are up 7% and there's one month of inventory. Well, that's the market update for Sacramento. You gotta help them understand what this stuff means. So I'm a big fan of leading indicators, not lagging indicators. The media typically reports lagging indicators. So here's what I mean by that. If you guys put a property, let's say you go show something this weekend and, and you put it under contract, when is that property gonna close? It's gonna close in September most likely. Could potentially even close in October with as bad as it is getting appraisals and stuff right now. So it's gonna close, but let's just go with September. Then what's gonna happen at the end of September, we're at PCAR, I'm assuming they put some data and some stats and stuff out for you. I know my board of realtors does. They put that out about the middle of the following month. So if this deal closes in September, then the board's gonna put the data out in the middle of October, and then the media is gonna pick up on it. It's probably gonna take them a couple weeks to pick up on it. So they're now reporting that data in November that happened in July or maybe August, but they're not talking about it until November. So those are lagging indicators. We can't talk about how many homes closed. We can't talk about median sales price. We can't talk about sale price to list price ratio because we don't know any of those data points until a property is actually closed, right? I can't tell you how many homes closed in September today. I don't know that info. I don't know that until afterwards. What I want to know is how many homes went pending right now because that's much more relevant data. So the data that I like to focus on, my degree is in economics. I'm a, a charts and graphs geek. I love understanding why things move the way that they do and how this reaction causes that reaction. That stuff's very valuable to know. So the things I like to look at is how many new listings were there this month? In July, I could tell you how many new listings were. I don't even need somebody to pull. I can just go on the MLS, type in list date, and it's gonna tell me you know, from 7-1 to 7-31, how many new listings were there? I could see this information. I wanna know how many new homes came onto the market, and then I wanna know how many went pending or under contract. Because that information is what they're gonna be reporting in October, November. But that's the info that's gonna tell me the direction the market's headed. Because I know if we had 7,700 homes come on the market, but we had 8,700 homes go off the market, we just contracted our inventory even tighter. Well, I also know that when you contract inventory, as I mentioned, when one thing happens, there's a, a reaction. Well, the reaction is if inventory contracts, price goes up. So I wanna take this data. The four points I like to look at is new listings, pending listings, supply of homes for sale, and days on market. Those are the data points that I like. And I can get all those data points at the end of the month for that month. I'm not three or four months out. I can get that data. As soon as July's over, I can tell you those four figures very easily. And I can pull it myself from the MLS. I don't need a statistician to do this. So those are what the four stats I like to give in my videos. And then at the end of every one of my videos, you guys are welcome to Google Kyle Whistle Market Update. The way that I end every video is if you are watching this video and you are thinking about buying a home, here's what this means to you. And if you are thinking about selling a home, here's what this means to you. Most important part of your entire video. And there's a little subtle thing that you probably caught in there is I said you, 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 you. I don't know about you guys, do any of you guys watch YouTube as a group? You guys all watch it by yourself probably watch it in bed or while you're on the pot. That's, it happens, that's why you need captions. Um, people watch videos by themselves, they don't watch them in a group. But what do a lot of people do in their videos? They're like, hey, what's up Sacramento? How's everybody doing? So if any of y'all out there thinking about selling, you know, you might be in this bucket. Like for, for those people over there, like, no, it's you, you. You, you, talk to the individual. When I'm recording a video, I want you to be like looking in your eyes through the freaking camera because I want you to make eye contact with me when you watch that video and I want you to feel like I'm talking directly to you. Every video, get rid of everybody. Hey, Facebook, hey, all y'all, hey, Sacramento, hey, Plaster County, like get that out of your brain. Like don't say that stuff anymore. Talk to an individual every single time. I hosted a radio show for like five years. That was the number one thing I learned is Always talk to the individual viewer, the individual listener. It's one of the best things you can do in your videos. So when you shoot that market update video, 
If you are thinking about buying a home here in San Diego, this is what this means to you. And if you are thinking about selling your home here in San Diego, this is what it means to you. Most important thing you can do in that market update video. The second video is an FAQ video. So this is something I learned early on. If you've been asked a question three times, you're gonna get asked that question 300 times. You might as well, back in the day, we used to write a blog article about it. Now we shoot a video about it. One of my favorite videos there is right now is how do I avoid foreclosure when my forbearance ends? What's going to happen to the market when the eviction moratorium ends? Think about things like that that are very timely relevant. But you're also going to record a lot of the staples like what is a short sale? What is a foreclosure? How does the foreclosure process work in Sacramento? Um, three tips for getting your offers accepted. Three tips for selling your home for the most money. Just FAQs, things that you're repeated over and over and over your career. You should have a video. So we send two videos a month out every single month. Um, I'll give you guys three ways to do this, just depending on what kind of budget you're playing with. The system that we use is called Viral Marketing, V-Y-R-A-L. It costs you five, 600 bucks a month to do it, but it's done for you. They literally will send you the webcam, They'll send you the lighting. You'll have a coach. They'll tell you, here's the video you need to shoot. Here's the script that you need to shoot. They'll be on a Zoom with you while you shoot the video so they can watch you shoot it. They'll critique it. They'll be like, hey, this was good. This was bad. Let's shoot it one more time. All right, nailed it. Go ahead and hit the send button. We'll take care of the rest for you. They'll take care of the editing. They'll drop in the intro, the outro, the lower thirds with your name, and they'll make it look really pretty. They will handle sending it out to everybody. They'll send you a report, let you know who opened it, who clicked play, who clicked the links. It's a done for you service. If you have the budget, it's the best way to go. We still use it today and I have three full-time videographers. Second option is BombBomb. If you guys don't have BombBomb, you need BombBomb. I think you can get it for like 30 to 50 bucks a month. It's the biggest no-brainer in real estate. Find a way. Go donate some plasma every month or something if you need to. You need to have BombBomb. BombBomb um, bon is a built service for realtors to send videos. It's fantastic. It's very affordable. Um, what you lose is the editing. Nobody's going to edit it for you. Nobody's going to distribute it for you. You still got to do that. But BombBomb is going to add some tracking in there so you know who opened it, you know who played it, which is going to be helpful information because if somebody opened or played my video, I should probably talk to that person, right? should probably say, hey, Bob, I, I saw you watched our video on how to avoid foreclosure, and I just want to give you a call, see how everything's going. Hey, what kind of videos could we shoot in the future? We're in a conversation now. Because if I call you and I know you watched my video and we can have a conversation about that, that's going to open the conversation, and then I'll go into the normal Ford conversation. If you guys don't know Ford, it's a simple acronym, Family, Occupation, Recreation, Dreams, F-O-R-D. Family, Occupation, Recreation, Dreams. That's your simple check-in phone call with people you haven't talked to in a while. If you've got no budget, or you've already hit your limit on plasma donations for the month, there's a service called Soapbox. Um, and it's made by Wistia, W-I-S-T-I-A, Wistia. So the service is called Soapbox by Wistia. This one's free. So it still will allow you to send out videos very much like BombBomb. You just lose a lot of the tracking capabilities. It doesn't have an app to make it easy. Um, gives up some of that. I don't really care which one of these three you do. You do the one that fits your budget, but do one of these. You've got to get video content out to your database on a regular basis and add value. It's super, super important. So next thing we like to do with our database is if they're sellers, um, you need to do you need to do something that's going to help them understand the market value of their home and you're gonna do 12 of those. So again, we'll, we'll talk about something I've learned when I speak is I wanna make sure I give options for everybody. So some of you guys got no money, that's cool. There's a service called CoreFact, C-O-R-E-F-A-C-T. <clears throat> so CoreFact has a free option. Um, if you go on CoreFact's website, uh, it's gonna look like a postcard company, and it is. It's a great postcard company. If you've been wanting to farm and you haven't done it, check out CoreFact. But what they don't tell you on CoreFact is you can go in the back end of it, upload your entire database of everybody that owns a home, and they'll start sending out an email update every month to your entire database for free. 
Very, very valuable. The number one thing people want to know that own a home is, what is my home worth? And what did that home sell for down the street? That's what everybody wants to know. So give them that information. So CoreFact has a free option. And then you have, if you want the best option, there's something called HomeBot. Um, so while you're hitting your lender up telling them that you want them to cover $100,000 of an EMD, you also need to tell your lender you want HomeBot. And they can help offset some of this cost for you. Um, HomeBot is just like CoreFact. It'll send an update once a month. The benefit is it has way more data on it. It's not just a home value. It'll tell them, here's how much equity you have in the home, AKA if you sold, how much money you're putting in the bank. It'll tell them, hey, if you refinanced your home, here's what you would stand to save every month. If you want to Airbnb your home, here's what you could Airbnb it for. If you want to rent it, here's a good rent. It's a lot more data. And then there's a lot of analytics where it's tracking what are they clicking to. CoreFact doesn't have as much of that. Um, HomeBot will also integrate with a lot of CRMs. We use Follow-Up Boss. Um, so I'll get a notification in Follow-Up Boss if somebody engages with that HomeBot report. It's very valuable for me. It saves me time. CoreFact will send you updates if they engage as well in an email, but it's not in your CRM. So anytime I don't have to bounce back and forth between systems, I like that. Um, and HomeBot's pretty affordable. So strongly recommend you guys check that out. So those are a few non-negotiables but we're just kind of getting started on this. Um, <laughs> you see where we're going, like we're on top of people. Um, you should be doing client appreciation events. If I was out here, I'd get a friggin' ice cream truck. <laughs> Snow cones. I'd rent out that cool water slide park down the street. <laughs> Seriously, I would. Um, you gotta do some client appreciation events. These are huge. I don't care if you have five past clients or 5,000. Um, you should be doing events. I'm not kidding, I would, if, especially if I'm farming right now and I live up here and it's hot like this every day, have the Kona ice truck come in the neighborhood and give free freaking snow cones away to every kid in the neighborhood. Like every parent there will love you. We've actually had Kona ice trucks at our open houses. Um, so there's a lot of different client event things you can do. Um, if you guys want a really good one, there's two massive movies coming out later this year. There's the new Ghostbusters is coming out and the Top Gun movie you're coming out, those are gonna be massive movies. Those are the two biggest movies in the last two years. Rent out a movie theater for a night. I like this event because it's easy. All I gotta do is fit the bill, however, <laughs> bless you. There's 100 seats in the movie theater, it's 10 bucks a ticket. There you go, take my $1,000, like, we're good, we're done. Um, actually, that's only like 1,000 bucks, it's nothing. Um, rent out a movie theater. We do them in the morning time and we do them on the opening weekend. So we usually do them on like Saturday morning, the weekend the movie drops. And we just buy the whole theater out. And then have all your clients come and they're like, oh my gosh, you invited me out to a movie, this is so cool. It's a very easy event. But what's cool with these client appreciation events is it gives you an excuse to do a lot of things. So we try to do four a year. So four times a year, they're gonna get an email invite from us. Four times a year, they're gonna get a, a mailed invite from us. Four times a year, they're gonna get a call from us. Four times a year, they're gonna get a text from us. This is 16 touches just for these client appreciation events. They're also gonna see it on social and stuff because we're gonna promote it there. But one of the things I've learned is whether you're a solo agent or you're running a team, it could be hard to call that client that you haven't talked to in a while. Or that person, like you maybe sold their home like four years ago, you've never followed up with them one time. Like, you guys all know you have that person, right? Like, a little easier to call them, be like, hey, Sarah, it's been a long time. I want to let you know, you know, we're doing this event. It's coming up. We're running out the theater. We're going to have Top Gun. It's going to be awesome. Love for you to come. Sarah's like, who's this? New phone? Who this? <laughs> no, she's going to be, she's like, oh, hey. You'll actually be surprised. Your clients remember you. Because when you helped them buy a house, that was like a huge deal to them. They remember like every little detail. You forgot about them because you work with a ton of people since. They remember everything about you. I promise you. They're actually excited to hear from you. And it's unexpected. In very few industries do people ever follow up afterwards. Like think about when you go to your dentist. Does your dentist call you once in a while like, hey, how's it going? Just want to check in. Like it doesn't happen. When you actually do that, they're surprised. Like, whoa. They never expect it, but it's very welcomed when it comes. Invite them out to a movie night. Um, other things we've done, we've done Easter egg hunts, we've done um, movies at the park, we've done barbecues at the park, ice cream trucks, 
Um, we've done, we do a holiday party where we have Santa come. We've done pie giveaways during Thanksgiving. That one's very easy too. Um, we try to, I think we're, one we're getting queued up right now is we're renting out a roller skate rink for a night. We're inviting all our clients into that. So we try to do four events a year because there's acres of diamonds. I want to work with these people. Um, so we do this. We hit them up four times for each of these. And the beautiful thing is once I tell somebody like, hey, do you want to come to this event? They're like, no, it's cool. Okay, well, hey, while I'm having the phone, how's everything going? How's the family? Oh, how's work? Oh, what have you guys been doing for fun? Are you guys doing anything exciting? Forward, right? Um, but these open up a lot of conversations and it helps you and or your agents get over the hump of being scared to call their clients. Because it's a lot easier for me to get my agents to call their clients when they get to offer them coming to a free party that I'm paying for. But I'm happy to pay for it because I know it's going to result in a number of transactions coming out of it. So these are just a few of the strategies. There's a million more strategies. We use Ylopo. Um, so we have Follow Boss as our CRM. Ylopo is our website. And with Ylopo, we're literally retargeting our entire database every single day. We're hitting them with property videos. We're hitting them with branding videos. We're hitting them nonstop. Like we're literally hitting our client every single day. There's not a day that goes by that our clients aren't seeing us. We run, we do billboards, we do all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So you've got to work this database. Like before you worry about any new lead sources, just figure out, just implement what I showed you. And most of this stuff costs you little to no money. Just do this. Like if nothing else from today, have a little moment of self-realization. Like, damn, I haven't followed up with anybody in a long time. Because sometimes we get in this mode, right? Where we're, especially when the market's hot, we're just hustling. Right? We're just hustling, we're doing deals, we're doing deals. We forget about all these people back here that we've done deals with that have actually came to know, like, and trust us. One of the things that I've learned, this has been a really valuable lesson, it's probably the most valuable lesson I've learned in the last year. The first transaction we do with somebody is the least profitable transaction we're going to do with somebody. And the reason I say that is, think about Zillow, for example, right? We're paying up here, you guys are probably paying 100, 200 bucks a lead if you're on their old system. If you're on their new system, you're paying 35% of your commission to them. How much profit are you really making off that first transaction? It's very, very little profit that you're making, right? You had all that cost to buy the leads and then all the time that you spent and all the systems that you had to use to stay in touch with them for them to finally pop. Your cost of sale. I know our cost of sales like five grand in San Diego, but our average commission is 16 grand, so we're cool with it. But still, it's five grand, right? So my profit's maybe only 11. And now I'm splitting that with the agent, right? It, it gets chopped down. But guess what happens when that client comes back? Now that five grand, that's already, that's gone. The next transaction I do with them, that's pure profit. And then when they refer me, their brother, their sister, their coworker, their relative, like, that's pure profit. I didn't have a big fat expense to get that repeat client. Maybe this event, right? That I'm gonna spend a couple grand for an event a few times a year. Or I'm gonna spend five grand for one client. So think about that. The first transaction is the least profitable transaction you do with somebody. When they come back as a repeat client, it's damn their pure profit. When they refer you somebody, it's damn their pure profit. So make sure you guys are taken care, right? It's all here. It's in your palm of your hands right now. Like you are literally touching your acres of diamonds. Quit trying to sell the farm and go chase diamonds all around the world because you guys are standing on them right now. There it is. All right, uh, circle prospecting. This is a huge one for us right now. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with this? Oh, I'm surprised. Okay, good. Um, circle prospecting. How many of you guys have a buyer who knows what they want, it just doesn't exist right now? Can I get those hands? That should be all of them, right? You guys all have a buyer who's like, if I could just find this, I'd buy it. Come. First, make sure they're not looking for unicorns. My daughter looks every day, she hasn't found a unicorn yet. They're not real, they don't exist. But if your client's looking for something that exists, Go earn your fucking money and go find it for them. Because your job is not to just check the MLS every day and wait for the listing to hit the market. Your job is to go find it. What are you doing waiting for them? I'll tell you what happens. Your buyer, 99% of the time, is telling you about the property long before you know about it. 
because this consumes their life. They've got searches set up on like 16 different websites. As soon as a new listing hits the market, they got an email from Trulia, from Redfin, from Homes, from Realty. Like they know about the property. They've gotten hammered with. They're calling you. Hey, when can we go see it? You're like, see what? Like, Shit, let me log in the MLS. I don't know. That's what's happening. Like that's what's happening. So are you really doing anything? Do you really deserve a 10, 20, $30,000 commission if you're just waiting for your client to send you something they found on Zillow? I don't think you do. I think you should go find them a property. If I got a client who knows what they want and if I can find it, they will buy it, I'm gonna go find it. I'm not gonna wait for it to hit the MLS so that I gotta compete with all of you guys. I'm gonna go find it and I have no competition. So circle prospecting is putting a pin on the house or the area that your client wants to buy in, drawing a circle around it, pulling in the contact information for everybody that lives in that circle, and then you prospect them. So we use a service called Cole, C-O-L-E, Cole Realty Resource. I'm sure there's others, Cole, C-O-L-E, Realty Resource. I think it's a couple grand a year. And I can pull in names, phone numbers, physical addresses, email addresses, cell phone numbers for everybody in that circle. You should probably prospect them. I like, in this order, I like to send them a piece of physical mail. So we write a little letter like, hey, this is the Smith family, and I'll fight you. Love letters, do them every time. I don't care what anybody tells you, do them. Um, if you guys haven't noticed, the new RLA actually says love letters are okay if the seller checks it, so we can get rid of that weird thing going on with love letters. Um, but I'm gonna write a letter and I'm like, here's the Smith family, they're looking to live in Elk Grove, they want a 3-2, 1,500 square feet, they're willing to pay up to 750, and they're looking for something with a pool. If you happen to have a home that fits this criteria, they're willing to pay top dollar, they'll close as fast or slow as you want. If you need a little bit of time to move after it closes, we'll take care of giving you that for free. And by the way, my buyer doesn't need any contingencies. You think you might get some phone calls back? <laughs> Especially if that letter went to only people in Elk Grove that have three bedroom, two bath homes with the pool. I guarantee you, you're gonna get some phone calls back from that. So send that letter. Send that letter via an email. Take that list, put it into Facebook as a custom audience and run ads at those people. Then get your ass out there and knock the door. You might wanna wait till it cools off a little bit. Might want to do that in the late afternoon or early morning. Um, go door knock. Leave something behind. I want somebody to know that I knocked on their door. I don't want them just to have seen me on their ring. I want them to physically know I was there. Then call them. Text them. Stay on these people. Go find these freaking homes. Quit waiting for them to hit the MLS so you can compete with everybody in the room. Go find it. Because guess what, when you do find it, guess what, you're representing the seller and the buyer. You make twice as much money with zero competition. Anybody want that? It's, it's a fun place to play. So I encourage you guys to quit waiting for listings to hit the market, go find them. They're out there. There's a lot of people who've been holed up through COVID. They haven't been out of their house. They haven't watched the news. I'll tell you what, if you watch the news tonight, here's what they're gonna do. They're gonna talk about the Olympics and how the US fucked something up they're going to talk about the Delta variant, and they're going to talk about some political nonsense that's going on, and they'll probably talk about something in the Middle East. It's the same thing every night. A lot of people don't want to see that. They don't. So they don't watch the news. They don't know what's going on. Some people have no idea the market is red hot. They have no idea the values are, their values are going up 27% in the last 12 months. When you can swoop in and be the person who educates them on what's happening in their market, you're their hero and you get to make twice as much money with no competition. It's a beautiful thing. So start thinking about doing some circle prospecting. Expireds and FISBOs. Um, I think we've all felt a little bit of a slowdown in the market. Uh, my personal belief is we live in California and it's a beautiful place, um, but we don't believe in our government and I'm not gonna get super political on this, but when they said that COVID was gonna end on June 15th, we were all like, yeah, right. That's some bullshit. Guess what, it ended on June 15th and everything opened back up. And we were like, holy shit, they followed through. I'm getting the hell out of here. I'm gonna go on vacation, right? Like you scroll through your feed, like the people who aren't in the room, they're in like Maui right now, 
they're, you know, down in the Keys, like everybody's on vacation. There's way more people taking vacations right now than normal. There's always a dip that happens 4th of July. That dip was just a lot deeper because there's a lot more people taking vacations right now. But I think that we're going to see inventory increase a little bit. Well, when inventory increases, there's going to be some homes that don't sell. Do you know what to do? Do you know how to go after those expireds? I think you're also going to see some FISBOs that don't sell. Do you know how to go after those FISBOs? Because the FISBO, the reason they FISBOed is that they talked to their neighbor across the streets whose home sold in seven days with 20 offers, and all of a sudden they put theirs on the market, and now they're 20 days in and they haven't even had seven showings. And they're like, what the heck is going on? I thought this was going to be easy. That's opportunity for you to come in because they realize, oh, their home did sell in seven days with 20 offers because they had a great agent who knew what to do. Maybe I should get an agent. So I strongly encourage you guys to start brushing up on your skills when it comes to expireds and FISBOs. I know these have been kind of gone for a little while, but I believe that you're going to start seeing more and more of these. So I encourage you to start brushing up on that. <clears throat> um, the best coach out there that I've seen right now, his name's Brandon Mulrennan. Um, Brandon Mulrennan, he's up in Michigan. I think he's the best coach for expireds and FISBOs for today's market. Uh, Mike Ferry's a legend. I don't believe his scripts are up to par with what it takes today because this script's been the same script for 30 years and every agent in the world has been trained on it and says the same thing. And if you say the same thing as everybody else, you're going to get hung up on like everybody else. So I like Brandon Mulrennan a lot. Um, and there's another guy named Borino, B-O-R-I-N-O, -O, Borino. I would follow those two if you guys want to start learning a little bit more about expireds and FISBOs, but I would start brushing up on those skills because I think you're going to see more of them. Okay, um, another California thing. It's fun when being in California because we all experience the same thing. Um, being a landlord's been a little rough for the last year, right? Like we talked about, unless somebody's cooking meth in the garage, you can't evict them. That sucks. Nobody's been able to raise rents for the last year because you're worried if you raise the rent, they're going to not pay and then you're going to be stuck with them. So now you didn't get that return that you were expecting because you couldn't raise the rents. And then the laws are 100% in the tenant's favor. So if you want to evict them, even when they open it up, it's probably going to take you 6 to 12 months to evict somebody. California is not the best state in the world to own rental property. There's a lot of other states that it is significantly easier. You want to evict somebody in Texas, it takes like a week. And somebody shows up with a shotgun and says, get out of the house, y'all. Like, <laughs> There's a whole other animal in some of these other states. So I guarantee you there's a lot of people who own homes who are not happy owning this rental and want to get rid of it. So you might want to start marketing to them. And then you've got, this is a new term I just learned recently, I learned this from Brandon, furbos. Who knows what a furbo is? There you go. Yeah, for rent by owner. What if you went on Craigslist every day? What if you went on whatever other websites you guys have up here and found the for rent by owners? And just reached out and said, hey, I saw that you had your house up for rent. Um, you know, would you be interested in finding out what that home could sell for just before you rent it, just so you have a comparison of you know, what your options are? I don't know if you know this, but values in Sacramento have increased 27% in the last 12 months. And there's actually buyers out there today that will come in and write an offer that can close extremely quickly with no contingencies that I could bring that buyer to you. Would that be of interest to you? You think some people aren't going to take you up on that offer? Nobody's doing this. Nobody's hitting up Furbos. So start cruising Craigslist. Start driving around the neighborhood. Next time you see a for rent sign, call it. Offer that service to them. No obligation. Hey, we'll just sit down. We could do a, you know, a rent versus sell analysis. I could show you how much you could net if you sold the home. We could also look at if you rent it. We all know there's a lot of people leaving California right now, and a lot of them are like, oh, I'm going to hold on to this property. I'm going to rent it out. They've never dealt with tenants, toilet, trash. They haven't dealt with that. They haven't dealt with our crazy tenant landlord laws. They have no idea what they're doing. And a lot of them don't realize if they sell now, they could sell and keep all that money tax-free. But when they move up to Idaho, and later on down the road, they sell that house, they're going to pay capital gains on that unless they exchange it. They're going to pay taxes on it. But they could sell today and take that money tax-free. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people think if they do that, 
they have to go buy another home because they think everything's a 1031. Not when it's your primary. So some of these furbos, when you call them, they're gonna be like, oh yeah, we just, you know, we just moved out, we're moving to Boise, um, so we're just gonna rent it out. Hey, would, would it be worth it for 15 minutes if I could show you how I could put a few hundred thousand dollars in your pocket tax-free versus dealing with tenants, toilets, and trash? You think there's not gonna be a few people who take you up on that offer? I think so. All right, two left. Cool, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end too. I just not want to go to this next slide. It's cool, I'll take a while. I just keep skipping that other one. There we go. All right, this is one I'm really, really passionate about right now. Um, if you could sell a listing with zero marketing, sell it over 10% above market value, and make 5% commission, would any of you be interested? This is almost like that 8% button I told you about, huh? Would you guys all be interested in that? Cool. Quit trying to fight Open Door, quit trying to fight Zillow offers, quit trying to fight OfferPad, quit trying to fight these guys and understand you can work with them. These guys are currently in the biggest pissing contest I've ever seen. These guys are all publicly traded companies and they need to report revenue to Wall Street. If they don't report revenue to Wall Street, Wall Street's not happy. So they are in this competition right now to buy as many homes as they possibly can. They do not care if they make a profit on these homes. They just want to buy homes because when they buy the home and ultimately sell it, the amount they sell it for, they get to report as revenue. Wall Street likes revenue. Investors like revenue. I have three of them under contract right now. Each one of them is in escrow 10% plus above what the most recent model match sold for. So I have one in my neighborhood. Last model match sold for a million 72,000. They are paying 1.19 million, $127,500 over the last model match. And the model match was in significantly better condition. Then another one in my neighborhood Last model match was 590. They're paying 653,220. $63,220 over the last model match. I got another one, 500,000 last model match. They're paying 610. That's crazy. Like you cannot sell these homes for what these idiots are paying right now. You can't. I promise you, you can't. Start working with them. Because here's the thing. Everybody thinks like, oh, I don't want to lose my buyers to them. You can submit the offer for your buyer or for the seller. There's no rule that says you can't. They'll work with you, they'll cooperate. It'll actually ask you when you submit the property, are you the owner or the agent? If you have a listing agreement in place, they have to respect it. They're not gonna go around you. They can't illegally go around you. So you submit it, and here's the crazy thing is we used to work with Zillow offers. The fees back when we started with them, they used to be five to 10 plus percent. We're seeing a lot of them down at like 1% right now, one. Like the only fee that's going to Zillow is 1%. Well, guess what? That allows you a little bit more room to put your commission on top of it. Zillow has no problem with you stacking your commission on top of the deal. As long as your buyer or your seller's cool with it, they're cool with it. Same thing for OfferPad, Opendoor, or whoever else you guys have up here. So before you put these listings on the market, submit it to these guys. Your seller is going to love you for it because they'll close as fast as 10 days if you got somebody who's sitting on a vacant house and needs to get out of there really quick, or they'll let you have up to 90 days. And then even at the end of the 90 days, they'll let the seller stay for a few days afterwards. Are you going to be able to deliver that on the market? You probably can't. So we're submitting virtually every single one of our listings right now to these websites. We're getting our sellers are stoked because we're getting them 10% plus above what the last model match sold for. They don't have to deal with showings, repairs, open houses, you know, requests for repairs. They don't have to deal with any of that. They're getting a killer price and they get to pick their close date. You probably can't deliver that. But if you work with these guys, you can. And now you don't have to go run around and do open house signs when it's 180 degrees outside. It's pretty cool. So I encourage you guys to think about working with them. 
Submit your own house, right? You want to know how this whole thing works? Submit your own house. Just go through their funnel. This is something you should do with everything, just as a heads up, like a little rabbit hole real quick. Like if you're paying for leads on Zillow, have you ever signed up as a lead on Zillow to like see what happens? You probably should. Like you should probably know how this person got to me. You got to know the journey that they went on so that you know how to talk to that person. Well, maybe you should submit your own house to Zillow, to Open Door, to OfferPad. Why don't you see what happens? If you don't own your home, submit your landlord's house. <laughs> and then when they come back with an offer, say, hey, Mr. Landlord, I want to sell your house. <laughs> Just go through the funnel. Understand how the funnel works. Understand how the process works. Um, we're signing our listing agreements. We're putting whatever our negotiated commission is if we go to the market. We make it clear to the client and then we work with a couple institutional investors. I don't ever use the words open door offer pad or Zillow offers. That is not of the client's concern. The concern of the client is that I'm going to bring them offers from institutional investors. We build in there, here's the commission if we go to market. Here's what the commission is if we work with one of the institutional investors. I'm going to submit it to the institutional investors. I'm going to see what those numbers come back at. And once those numbers come back, the seller is either going to take one of those or they're going to go forward with putting it on the market. Right now, they're paying crazy prices with low fees. Are they still going to do that in six months? Who knows? But they're doing it now. We should probably take advantage of it. And so what happens is I get those offers back. There's a service we work with that actually helps us with this called Zavi, Z-A-V-V-I-E. Z-A-V-V-I-E. I'll write this down for you guys. So Zavi will aggregate all of these offers for you. So you just submit it one time through them, and they'll submit it to all the different iBuyers that are active in Sacramento for you. And then they'll even give you an offer sheet that compares all the offers side by side. And you can just sit down with your seller and say, hey, here's the options. Which one do you want to go with? Or I just do it myself. I submit it very simply. It's literally a three-line uh, spreadsheet. And I put investor one, investor two, investor three. And then I put the price, and then I put fees slash commission. And then I'll just say, okay, these guys will pay 650, and their 1% plus my 5% is six. These guys will pay 660, and their fee is 6% plus my 5% makes 11. Um, and then these guys are 600, and their all-in is 8%. Do you want to go with one of these, or do you want to go on the market? They're so like, I could sell it for 650, and it's only 6%. You said we were only going to sell it for 600. Let's just take the money. Cool. I just made 5%. Done. <laughs> Cancel the open house. Hey, honey, I don't have to work this weekend. I just made double commission, and I don't have to go sweat my ass off putting out open house signs, trying to find the ice cream man because it's hot. <laughs> Work with the iBuyers, guys. They're a huge advantage for you. The other thing you got to get yourself familiar with, and Zavi can help with this as well. I don't own Zavi, just as a heads up. Um, there's something called bridge lenders. Homelight is another one of these bridge lenders. I don't own Homelight. Google owns Homelight, or part of it. Um, Homelight has this really cool program where if I have somebody that needs to sell in order to buy, we know that you cannot write a contingent offer today, right? People are going to laugh at you when you write a contingent offer. What they will allow your seller to do is tap into 90% of the equity in their home. So you need somebody who's got a reasonable, about, reasonable amount of equity. This doesn't work for the person who bought the home six months ago and now wants to do this. It's, this is your person who's owned the home six or seven years. They bought it for 500. It's now worth 800 and they want to sell that, and they want to buy the million and a half dollar house. What Homelight will do is take 90% of the value of the home, and they'll put it under contract at that 90, allow your client to then go find the home they want to buy. As soon as your client finds the home they want to buy, Homelight will firm up the timing on their offer. So let's say you triggered this one to close on Friday. Homelight's cool, we'll go ahead and close on Wednesday. We'll release those funds to you on Wednesday so that you have them to close on your new home on Friday. 
And then once your new home moves, just go ahead and move into your new home. And then we'll take care, we'll clean your house up, we'll get it fixed up, we'll stage it, and then we'll sell it for you. And then when your house sells, whatever it sells, that other 10% that we didn't give you, we'll give you the rest of it once it sells. And if it sells for more than what we thought, we'll give you the 10% plus whatever. It literally takes your buyer, who is gonna be contingent, and turns them into a non-contingent buyer, and it allows your client to avoid a double move, which really sucks. Because now they got to go buy the new home first, move out of the old home, clean and stage the old home, sell the old home, no showings, no open houses, none of that. You guys should start figuring out these bridge lenders. There's a lot of them. There's another one called Knock. Um, Knock is nationwide. And there's a bunch of other ones coming up. I don't know who you guys have here. Um, but the other ones that I know of, uh, Homeward, Tim Heil started that. Shout out to him. He just got a massive round of funding. Um, Homeward, H-O-M-E-W-A-R-D. There's another one called Ribbon. And there's probably a million others that are going to pop up. But these guys have realized that there's a pain point in this process of selling and buying. How can we bridge this gap? And the fee for that with home lights like 1.5%. But here's the thing is, yeah, it costs 1.5%, but how much is it going to save them when they buy that new home? They're not going to have to overpay to compensate for the fact they're contingent. So they're probably going to save at least 1.5% on the purchase. And in addition, they don't have to deal with the dang double move, which really sucks. There's a huge price that people are willing to pay for convenience. So start learning about these bridge lenders because when you go meet with a seller and the seller's like, well, what makes you different than her? You could be like, oh, well, did they tell you about the Home Light Trade-In program? No, what's that? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> now you have a USP that nobody else has because if you're going into your listing appointments and your USP is like, I'm gonna take professional photos and I'm gonna put it on Zillow and I'm gonna do an open house with an ice cream truck, like, Everybody's going to do that now. You're not special. But when you can come in and help them understand you could bridge this gap between their sale and their purchase and make it seamless for them, you're going to earn that listing. Last thing, and then I think we'll have a little bit of time for some Q&A, um, is you got to align with these channel and referral partners, especially if you're new. If you're new and you don't have any money, you can't afford to go pay Zillow $100, $200 for a lead or Realtor or any of these companies. It's not an option for you. You gotta go huff it and do open houses in the heat. <laughs> or start aligning with these channel partners. We call these channel partners because I can turn this channel on and it floods me with business. And I go and get channels like OpCity with Realtor.com is one of our channels. Flex with Zillow is one of our channels. Elite with Homelight is one of our channels. Um, I got into this industry during the foreclosure um, and short sale crisis, and what was great for me at that time is I could just go get a relationship with Fannie Mae, and every time Fannie Mae foreclosed on a house in San Diego, they were just like, here you go, Kyle, we got another one for you. Then I got in with HUD. Every time they foreclosed on a house, here you go, Kyle, we got another one for you. Got another one for you. I didn't have to go sell your house, then his house, then her house, then his house, then hers. I just got in with you, and you just gave me all the listings. That's how these channel partners work. So start thinking about the different channel partners that are available. Those are the three biggest. Um, Homelight, and ideally you want to make it to their Elite program. You have Zillow and their Flex program. And then you have Realtor and their Op City program. Um, I know a lot of you guys are with EXP in here. I don't know if you guys know this, but you could just send a message to Deb Penny and tell her to turn you on to Op City and you can have that turned on tomorrow. Hopefully you guys knew that. Hopefully Brent told you. If not, sorry, Brent. Um, <clears throat> but you can just literally, they have a corporate account with OpCity. You could have that one turned on tomorrow. The great thing with these websites is there's zero upfront cost. You just pay a success fee. If deal doesn't close, you don't pay anything. I'm good with that. I don't have to pay a penny and I get all these leads and I only pay you if they close. I'm good with that. I can't lose money in that scenario. I like that. And then the scarcity mindset kicks in, you're like, oh, but I don't wanna give them 35% off the top. Okay, don't, I, I will. <laughs> My agents will. Everybody else's agents will. You're the one dumbass who's trying to hoard it. You got the scarcity mindset, I don't wanna give my money away. Oh, would well, you wanna go pay $200 a lead? 
Do you want to follow up with the 200 leads that it takes to get that one person who's actually ready to, to buy or sell? Or do you want to let somebody else do it all for you? You take the phone call and you convert one out of 10. I like converting one out of 10. I don't have time to follow up with 500 stupid Facebook leads to find the one person who's going to buy in 18 months, because that's about the conversion rate on Facebook leads. It's the worst converting lead in the industry. But people sell you on it because they're like, I got 500 leads, this is great. Or if you're running a team, you're like, I gave my agents 500 leads. You buried your agents in a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> you give your agents leads that convert at 10%, they freaking love you. Every time they pick up the phone, it's like $500 every time they answer the phone. Your agents love that. And you just got to help them understand, or you got to understand yourself that I need to do deals. There's a lot of people leaving California. If all I do is work with sellers, they're all leaving town. I got to work with buyers. Because if I work with the buyers today, five years from now, those become sellers. And then when they sell, they sell and they move up. I don't have to hardly work at all anymore because all the people that I sold homes to years ago, my acres of diamonds, I do a really good job taking care of them. They're all now coming back. My friends who I sold them little $200,000 condos, they're now worth 600. They're selling the 600 and they're buying the million. Now I'm doing a million six pure profit. I want to get as many people who are coming into California as possible. So yeah, you're going to take a haircut of 35%. That's fine. You're actually working with clients who are staying here who are establishing a sphere of influence here, who are gonna ultimately sell that house they own here. I'll give up the 35% because I'm building my listing inventory for the rest of my life. I'm fine giving up 35%. And you better believe it's gonna be 50 before you know it. Just be prepared so it's not a surprise when it happens. That's fine, if I don't have to spend any money up front, you're gonna do a lot of the heavy lifting for me. All we gotta do is show them a place and write a contract and on average we're making on those like five grand, I'm good with it, I'll do that all day. Especially because a lot of those are buying and they're ultimately gonna be selling. And some of those that are coming in as a buyer, they actually need to sell in order to buy. So now you got two transactions out of those. Or some of these referral sites actually will give you sellers. Again, Homelight is the best. Um, we get a ton of seller leads from Homelight. There's another one called Fast Expert. I'll write some of these down too, just so you have them. So you got Realtor Op City, you got Zillow, Flex. And by the way, if you turn Flex down, you'll eventually have no Zillow. Just foreshadowing that because everything's going to be on Flex. You want Home Light Elite? This is my favorite we do get a good amount of sellers. Another good one that we do get some sellers from is Fast Expert. And then there's another one called Referral Exchange. Then there's a million others, but those are, those are the ones that I can attest to that we actually do business with. Um, I would make sure you're on all of those. The key when you guys are on these websites is not just being on them, but actually utilizing them. Like make sure your profile's complete. Make sure your past sales are uploaded. They all tell you they're going to sync your past sales up with the MLS. Don't trust them. Upload your past sales every month. Make sure that it's updated because most of these sites are sending out the leads based on where agents have actually sold homes, especially Homelight. Homelight's job is to say, hey, oh, you want to buy an Elk, Elk Grove? Here's the top three agents in Elk Grove. Well, if you're not uploading your Elk Grove sales, they're not going to know you sell there. You're not going to get that lead. The person who uploaded their past sales is. So make sure you complete your profiles. Make sure you send your, up, um, your past sales to them. And then most importantly is you got to understand what are their expectations. Because they're not going to just give you these leads for free and just let you shit the bed with them. Like They're going to make sure you're actually following up with them. And they all have different cadences that they like to be updated. So you need to talk to whoever your rep is at each of these companies and say, hey, how often are you looking for me to update these leads? Because some of them want them updated every seven days and others want them updated every 30 days. Well, if one only wants it every 30 days, I, I don't want to waste anybody's time updating it every seven. But if the other one needs it every seven, I don't want to update it every 30 because they're going to think I'm not doing anything with it. So you need to talk to each one of these 
figure out what cadence do they want to be updated and adhere to that. Most of them are going to want not only a note of what you're doing, but they're going to want a status update. Well, you better make sure you understand what their status update means. Like Zillow has one that's called showing homes. Like, what does that truly mean? Does it mean what you think it does or does it not? They also have one that's like appointment set. Is their definition of an appointment set the same as your definition of an appointment set? Maybe, maybe not. You should probably figure that out. So when you get in with each of these, talk to the rep, find out what do you need? What are you looking for? How can I best position myself to receive as many referrals as possible? Guess what? They're not going to be mad at you for asking that question. They're actually going to be really excited that you're asking that question because what they're having to do with most people is like, hey, I told you I need an update every seven days. You haven't updated this lead. Hey, I told you I need an update every 30. What's going on? Hey, you said you, you met with this person, but they said they've never even talked to you before. Like, that's what they're having to do with most people. So when you actually call them and are like, hey, what do you need from me? Right? What, what are your expectations? How can I position myself to receive as many referrals as possible? It's a breath of fresh air because they're used to having to crack the whip on everybody. So these right here are my favorite. Get in with all five of those, and they're literally just going to hand you deals. And if they don't close, you don't pay anything. It's 100% profit margin. And they convert at a way higher rate because what they all found is that if they just give you the lead initially, the raw lead, Zillow ran a study and it was somewhere around 50% of leads never got a phone call. People are paying like 100, 200 bucks a lead saying like, hey, I want to go see this place and they don't get a phone call. Well, guess who they think didn't call them? They don't think Kyle Whistle didn't call them. They think that Zillow didn't call them because they didn't pay attention to whose face was over there and now the faces are even gone. So their assumption was Zillow was going to call them to schedule that showing. That call didn't happen. Now they're pissed off at Zillow. Well, now they bounce off Zillow and they start using Realtor. That's what was happening. So they decided, let's stop giving the leads to the Realtors. We'll take the leads ourselves because we know we'll follow up with 100% of them. We'll nurture the leads. And then when the lead's ready to talk to an agent, then we'll give it to the agent. And we'll live transfer it too so we can listen to the phone call to make sure the agent knows what they're doing. In exchange, we're going to take 25, 35%. We'll pay that all damn day. I'll pay over and over and over again because it doesn't cost me anything to generate that lead. I love that. So I think that's the last of my 12 points. So hopefully I added some value for you guys today.